Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and welcome to part three of the series where we take a look at the Truth Factory and take a look at what she has to say about climate change. Part one can be found on Team Skeptic's channel, and part two can be found on AB Science's channel. Links to both of those will be in the description. So AB Science left off on the note of Climate Gate 2, Electric Boogaloo, which despite being so derivative is probably the most original thing she's said in the entire video. Let's take a look. In 2017, Climate Gate 2 Electric Boogaloo hit, when a whistleblower named Dr. John Bates exposed that the world's leading source of climate data, the NOAA, purposely published a sensationalized, flawed report exaggerating global warming using misleading and unverified data. That would be all fine and dandy if it weren't for the fact that Dr. John Bates actually said that his statements had been misused. And his actual criticism of the paper was that it didn't disclose some information. That information being that they used research, not operational data for its land surface temperatures. This report was rushed to publication right in time to influence the outcome of the Paris Agreement. The report claimed that the pause or slowdown in global warming in the period since 1998 that the IPCC's models failed to predict never existed, and that world temperatures had been rising faster than scientists expected. Now, thermometer records showed that warming basically stopped from 1998 to 2014 until they didn't. So anyone should be able to tell you that if you use 1998 as a starting point, it's not going to look like there's very much warming. Why? Because 1998 was an exceptionally hot year. It would be exactly like being in 1998 and going, well, 1998 was a lot hotter than 1997, and the only conceivable factor is climate change, and also, the rate of climate change must be a lot faster now. For some reason, I have my doubts that anybody would trust someone that says that. Now, this isn't to say that an exceptionally hot year can't be influenced by climate change. Of course it can. But don't pretend like everybody is saying that years like 1998 were only hot due to climate change, because of course there were other factors. Also, this graph shows that temperatures have clearly been rising since 1998. So yeah, there wasn't actually a pause, despite what climate change deniers would like you to think. As you can see, there is a major difference between the actual observed temperatures and the ones that these scientists were trying to push. Although, looking at these graphs, the temperatures relative to each other seem to follow the same pattern, except for that little bit at the end that you felt the need to point out. If I were to look at either of those individual graphs and you were not to tell me which one it was, I would still come to the same conclusion. It's also odd that these climate organizations were denying that the pause existed while simultaneously proposing dozens of excuses to explain it. Or it could just be that the models predict more warming than what is observed, so people are trying to say, hey, why is there less warming than what we expect? This shows that the policy debate surrounding global warming is not grounded in science anymore. And that systematic deceit is not a bug, it's a feature of these organizations. In fact, big climate change panels like the NOAA and the IPCC have become nothing more than political lobbying organizations masquerading as scientific bodies. Although something similar can be said about news outlets that use false and misleading information to trick people into thinking that climate change isn't real. But here's a very interesting thing to note. The IPCC has models which they use to make predictions and forecasts. Now, anybody that's been following all of the Flat Earth stuff will probably understand what I'm about to get at. Where are the models that have been developed by climate change skeptics? At least the IPCC has models, and they're working on them to make them better. That's far more scientific than any climate change skeptic. This was made even more apparent with Judith Gate. Judith Gate? Really? Is, is that what you're going to go with? You know, you can come up with better names for your scandals than just taking the scandal and adding gate to the end of it. Like, I don't know, come up with something like The Fun and Fantastical Adventures of Judith. That sounds way better. It turns out that the IPCC's extremely important report of the influence of the sun on the climate relied on only one solar physicist named Judith Lean, who has been linked to controversial manipulation of solar activity graphs in the past. Even worse is that Judith was backing up the assertions in the report with a single paper, in which Judith is a co-author. 
Now that would be pretty concerning if that was the only report that had any mention of the impact of solar activity on climate change. But it's not. Enter the WG1 AR5 report done by the IPCC in 2013, where in chapter 5 it asks, is the sun a major driver of recent changes in climate? Now this part does go ahead and explain things such as the solar contribution can explain global temperature fluctuations up to approximately 0.1 degrees, but it also says things like it cannot explain the observed increase since the late 1970s. And again, I'd like to reiterate a point that I made earlier. Where are all the climate change skeptics coming along and making climate models based on solar activity? Now I was going to go through all of the climate scandals one by one, but there are far too many, as you can see here. Okay, pause. Why the fuck does every single one of these scandals have to end in gate? That completely lacks originality. You know, you could have at least called one of them Al Gore's Flying Fabulous Funhouse Scandal, just to be a little more original. Okay, I'm done now. Continue. If global warming was as imminent and dangerous as the IPCC claimed, there would be no need to manipulate data or cherry-pick scientists. It's easy to say that the science is settled if your source is only one scientist, one paper, or one tree. Except you're the one that's acting like it's always one scientist, ignoring all the times when it's multiple scientists that happen to disagree with your view. Do you not see the irony here? And it's these controversies that gives us the perception that the global warming establishment has willfully engaged in a campaign to mislead the public. Except, even if all of those controversies meant something, it doesn't mean that global warming is not a threat. Perhaps they did it with the best of intentions. Maybe they believe that the dangers of anthropogenic global warming are so great that misleading the public with hyperbole is justified. But if it really was that bad, you wouldn't have to exaggerate. So reports get published showing scary extreme scenarios and the anxiety is not lost on the media that is completely unrestrained in the use of doomsday imagery and biblical language as it amplifies and manipulates the studies further for the sake of clickbait. Because headlines like, yeah actually it's not quite as bad as we originally thought, doesn't get quite as much attention as human civilization will crumble by 2050 if we don't stop climate change. In that case, your problem is with the media, not with the scientists. Of course the media is going to publish sensationalized headlines. That is what the media does to get clicks. So here's an idea. Why not go up to the media and, you know, make your own version of how dare you? See if that works. Here are some examples of exaggerated claims over the years that did not come to fruition. In 1979, experts said increased atmospheric carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels would cause the cooling of the United States by 16 degrees. In fact, there would be so much cooling that we would be entering an ice age in 200 years. Wow, if only we listened to them 40 years ago, we could have prevented ourselves from freezing to death. So yes, climate scientists have been wrong about climate in the past. They thought that CO2 was causing a cooling. But then they changed their mind because new information came to light. One of the things that scientists will do if they find new evidence is they will change their mind. That's what being a skeptic is all about. And then acid rain became a threat, but don't worry, 100 million dollars from the federal government should fix it. So acid rain was a real threat, but guess what fixed it? Regulations. Of course, rain is still more acidic than it should be, but it's way better than it used to be, and regulations designed to help cut back on pollutants such as nitrous oxides have helped a lot. In 1988, it was said that rising sea levels could completely cover the Maldives in 30 years. In 1989, a senior environmental officer from the United Nations said entire nations would be wiped off the face of the earth if global warming is not reversed by the year 2000. That deadline has now been pushed to 2020, which is getting pretty close. It was also predicted that Lower Manhattan would be underwater by 2018. In 2008, a NASA scientist predicted that the Arctic would be ice-free by 2018, which is something Al Gore said would happen by 2014. And these scientists predicted it would happen in 2015, this one says 2016, 2017, 
In 1989, The Guardian said that the only way to stop 12 feet of sea level rise was global communism. The UN said that there would be 50 million environmental refugees by 2010. In 2004, the Pentagon told Bush that climate change would destroy us by 2020. Too much snow, not enough snow, drought, and the only habitable place to live will be Antarctica. So getting things exactly right can be very tricky. Let's say that there was a fire that had been burning for three minutes in a house, and it was halfway through the house, and I said, I think that in three minutes, the house is going to be completely incinerated. And three minutes later, the house isn't completely incinerated. Does that mean that the house won't be completely incinerated at some point? No, of course not. Because there is a fire in the house, and until the fire is gone, it's probably going to completely incinerate the house. But the fact is, the earth is warming, ice caps are melting, sea levels are rising. Scientists may get the exact rates of these wrong, but that doesn't change that they're happening. So then credulous politicians use these sensationalized headlines in order to convince people that it's a good idea to impose things like a carbon tax, which have been so popular they've led to deadly riots. So just because a lot of people don't support an idea doesn't necessarily mean that that idea is bad. And of course, yes, carbon taxes sometimes can be implemented in much better ways than they are. A good example of this is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who hyperbolically and incorrectly claimed that we're all going to die in 12 years if we don't do something now. The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And as she said again, while well, building furniture. How many years until the world ends again? We have 12 years left to cut emissions by at least 50%, if not more. And for everyone who wants to make a joke about that, you may laugh. So I'm not sure if Crazy Cat Lady picked this up, but yes, in the first clip, AOC was being very hyperbolic. But in the second clip, it sounded a whole lot more reasonable. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I think there's a difference between oh, we've got 12 years left to cut carbon emissions by 50% compared to we're all gonna fucking die in 12 years! See you later! Bartender turned politician AOC is best known for sponsoring the Green New Deal, an environmental policy created in a weekend not by climate scientists, but by people with degrees in gender and sexuality studies which is why it's peppered with socialist nonsense like repairing historical oppression and giving money to those who are unwilling to work. But it's not just as simple as, oh, let's add a carbon tax. Oh, there we go, problem fixed. It is very much a multifaceted problem. Imagine this. Imagine you had a leak in one of your pipes and you kept going ahead and fixing the pipe. But the reason why the pipe was leaking all the time was because the water pressure was too high, which kept on leading to the same problem every time you fix the pipe. You also need to fix the water pressure. It's not just a simple case of let's just reduce CO2 emissions down to zero. There's a lot more to it and I'm going to get to it in a bit. At the end of the day, none of these people seemingly actually care about the environment or science. Even the Extinction Rebellion leader says it's not about climate. Of course not. The real enemy is toxic old white European racist heterosexuals. Again, it is a multifaceted problem. Now, while some of those things definitely seem a bit extreme, imagine if we managed to solve some problems which helped with other problems. Or should we just not try and solve any problems except for the one that we need to focus on? I'm surprised that the IPCC hasn't made a graph correlating toxic masculinity to temperature change, since it's easy to make a plotted graph out of three random data points and not only prove causation, but pretend that we can predict the future. Even worse is the Paris Agreement that everyone promotes as the greatest thing since sliced jello, but almost no one has actually read except for me and like four other people, including those who wrote it. It reads like Baby's First Globalist Manifesto, by stating things like, when taking action to address climate change, we should also promote the empowerment of women. Yeah, we don't need coal power, we just need girl power. I'm wondering, did you actually read it or did you just get to the fourth page and go, oh my god, them damn SJWs have filled it with nonsense. The only time it mentions anything like the empowerment of women or gender equality is in that particular paragraph that you are looking at. 
nowhere else. But there are good reasons for the empowerment of women to help fight climate change. Why is that? Because if you empower women to be able to make the decisions that they want to make, then they might go ahead and pursue careers instead of staying at home and having five kids. And if there are less humans being brought into the world, then the human impact on the environment will be less than if there are more humans being brought into the world. But this also feeds into some of the other stuff that you are talking about earlier. You know, like the scary socialist nonsense. Well, reducing wealth inequality can fix some of the other problems. Such as evidence that suggests that wealthier people tend to have less children. And also there's evidence that suggests that lowering wealth inequality could actually help reduce waste from individuals. Although there are other things that can be done, such as better education would be great, which I'm sure even Crazy Cat Lady would probably agree with. With the Paris Agreement, industrial first world nations are supposed to give $100 billion a year to developing nations like India and China to lower their emissions by investing in green technology, without any guarantee that it will do anything. And there is no penalization if countries don't keep their promises, which by the way almost none of them have. The thing that you're missing here though, is that some countries have had the advantage of being able to economically develop into a first world country by burning a whole lot of fossil fuels. It is important to incentivize poor countries to not use fossil fuels as they try and develop their nation, because otherwise they'll use fossil fuels to develop their nation. Pretty much economics is one of the biggest things that has to be taken into account here, because economics does influence how countries make decisions. But here's the math. Even if every government on the planet not only keeps every Paris promise, reduces all emissions by 2030, and keeps their emission reductions throughout the rest of the century, which they're already failing to do, temperatures will be reduced by just 0.17 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. And that's only based on the assumption that the climate models are accurate. That number is based on one study that assumes that the countries that are implementing policies will not implement better policies in the future. Some other estimates say that there could be a reduction of up to 0.9 degrees Celsius, which is far better than a reduction of 0.17. In the meantime, the Paris Pact is estimated to have a $100 trillion price tag. If human action is not causing climate change, the Paris Agreement is irrelevant. If it is, then the Paris Agreement is an obstacle to actual solutions. You'd have about the same outcome by paying Justin Trudeau to do a rain dance, and you know he already has an outfit picked out for it because he eats cultural appropriation for breakfast. So if the Paris Agreement is standing in the way of real solutions, what are the real solutions? But why wouldn't we just blindly trust the government, though? They would never lie to us, right? But let's follow the money trail. A few years ago, a propaganda campaign against Alberta oil sands and tourism began. It was spearheaded by a company called Corp Ethics, which created an anti-tar sands campaign, which was funded by the Rockefeller brothers. Yes, the same Rockefeller family that got tremendously wealthy because of oil. Ooh, everybody loves a great conspiracy. But let's see how long it takes for it to logically fall apart. Now around the time of the Iraq war and California energy crisis in 2003 to 2004, the Rockefellers strategized how to get control of the United States domestic energy policy. First, they sold off their investments in oil and coal and bought into alternative energy, including investing over $100 million into a company called Mainstream Renewable Power. And that's where your logic starts to show some cracks. You opened up with the claim that the Rockefellers began with an energy initiative to take over the world or whatever back in 2003 or 4. However, the backing of mainstream renewable power didn't happen until after the Rockefeller family decided to completely divest from fossil fuels in 2016. You might want to ask yourself, if the Rockefellers are key figures in the climate change myth, why did they wait until only a few years ago to jump off of the oil bandwagon? It's almost as if they saw the dangers of anthropogenic climate change and where the world was heading for future energy sources, which didn't look good for oil companies and decided renewable energy was where the family was going to make their money next. You know, because the Rockefellers are still human, and just like all humans, their babies gotta have Bugattis too. The oil barons became the oil Karens, and they want to talk to your manager. How dare you insult me like that by comparing me to those greenies? Hold up, you're on our side, Karen? 
No, you're always talking nonsense, especially when you advocate for vaccines. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, team. Back to you. According to a leaked memo from a secret Rockefeller meeting, their agenda was to wage war on oil companies, in particular Exxon. Among their tactics was manufacturing a scandal and applying as much political pressure as possible to get investors to divest from oil companies. So this memo that was leaked really wasn't leaked. It was sent out to lots of people, inviting them to an anti-Exxon and climate change political action party. The idea was to attack Exxon through political connections and exposing some of their practices, which they felt were in violation of state and federal laws. It was a dick move, but it's not like the Rockefellers got to the top without being some of the biggest dickheads. This meeting also tried to get climate change to be a topic of discussion in the 2016 elections, which makes total sense. If you're a big renewable energy company, then it's beneficial to have a pro-climate change president in office. None of this so far suggests a global conspiracy against all oil companies. Part of this plan for energy domination also included keeping Canada's oil out of the global market. Over $90 million over the last decade, bankrolled by the Rockefellers and several other pro-green foundations have been funneled to media and climate groups to oppose Alberta's oil industry, including to indigenous populations that oppose the Keystone Pipeline. Even celebrity spokespeople like Leonardo DiCaprio were involved. They even funded a questionable study to give their campaign the air of scientific legitimacy. So that you know, you have just set the bar for feline stupidity. The study you were showing, which I know you didn't read, was put together to increase the accuracy of climate models. Originally, the models were a bit inflated due to certain measuring stations being located too close to urban areas. The study showed that as you got closer to an urban area, the temperature would naturally increase. This study actually helps the anti-climate change narrative by suggesting that the numbers that were collected were too high. However, even with the corrected numbers, the evidence for man-made climate change is still irrefutable, but now it's a bit more accurate. And all of this was then used to influence Obama not to build the pipeline. If this was really about the environment, why would they go after a country with a cap on emissions, a carbon tax, and one of the largest forested areas in the world? Because the only thing the Rockefellers really care about greening is their wallets. Okay, so you do get it. The Rockefellers saw the upcoming change in energy sources, the impending downfall of oil, and they invested in their future. Everything else you were asserting is just something a normal energy tycoon would do to protect his interests. But all of this doesn't negate the scientific research that has gone on for decades that has empirically shown that humans' dependence on fossil fuels is changing our climate and not for the good. They are mere opportunists who only sponsor climate alarmism in order to enhance their leverage in the global arena. The Rockefellers and the Rothschilds did pretty much the same thing in the 1970s when they used a shadowy energy cartel to artificially inflate the price of uranium and drive out competition. And then they hired an environmental propaganda group who used several celebrities to very successfully taint public opinion of nuclear energy. You are only strengthening my argument. As once again, all you have proven is that the Rockefellers employ some very cutthroat business practices to ensure their wealth. But again, none of this has anything to do with climate science, which doesn't give a fuck how much money you have or what you stand to gain. Since then, the Rockefellers have used the guise of environmentalism in order to control the energy arena. In fact, the person who founded the UN Climate Initiative was Maurice Strong, who was a Rockefeller protege and self-described socialist, who, like the Rockefellers, made his fortune in oil and gas before turning on it. The Rockefeller Foundation to this day works very closely with the UNFCCC, the same organization that created the Paris Agreement. And while this is merely conspiratorial, at least you can admit that your whole rhetoric is merely conspiratorial and based on biased, non-factual interpretations of circumstantial evidence. The Rockefellers seem to have their eyes on South Africa, which is extremely rich in high-quality rare earth minerals, something that many modern technologies need and renewable energy technology cannot function without. This includes wind turbines, solar panels, batteries for celebrities' Teslas, and much more. 
So what you are saying is that the Rockefellers have invested in the renewable energy sector, and now they're looking to move into the market of the rare earth elements needed for this sector. That's like saying that the NHL is involved in a conspiracy because they want to buy their own Zambonis. This is the new oil. But let me put it to you like this. If you want to make money off of your green energy, all you have to do is crush the competition by making all of their energy sources seem as undesirable as possible. Then you pay people to pressure the government to cripple those industries. And then you create a market for your product by shadow puppeting the UN Climate Division into creating a wealth redistribution scam where tax dollars from first world countries go to highly populated developing nations to go green. Well, it really wouldn't make sense to give the sparsely populated countries the money to help them go green. No, what makes sense is to distribute the money where it's needed most, and that's in densely populated parts of the world. And the best part is, they get to do this under the guise of being climate heroes. Mainstream renewable power had record profits last year of over half a billion dollars. A couple of things that you are conveniently leaving out here. First, it quite clearly states on the picture you are showing that they had a loss of 5 million euros in 2017, and that was a full year and a half after the Rockefellers invested. Also, in the not-so-quite-clear part behind what would normally hold your tiny brain, it says that the profits came from the sale of a 45-megawatt wind farm in Scotland. So why does them making a record profit have anything to do with climate change or the Rockefellers? Meanwhile, since the Canadian oil industry was crippled, suicide rates in Alberta have increased by 30% due to mass oil field layoffs. Wow, that's really shitty, Kitty. Trying to use tragedies like suicides to push your anti-science, climate change denying agenda. You should never resort to such morally reprehensible tactics no matter how much evidence is stacked against you. You're a piece of shit, and you should just go crawl in your litter box and cover yourself up. The green industry has a dark underbelly that needs to be exposed. I'm not saying that the whole thing is a scam, I'm just saying that those who are pushing the climate agenda the hardest are those with the most to gain from it. You finally fucking get it. The ones who benefit most from oil being removed from the market are the ones pushing for it. It just so happens that in this case, the capitalist agenda also lines up with peer-reviewed empirical science, which is a good thing for the world we live on. But nobody wants to question this due to bad optics. You'll get called a science denier and get hit with a 97% consensus meme as if appeal to authority is an actual argument. The 97% figure comes from a few very obscure, cherry-picked surveys and a handful of papers. One of the most recent and suspicious 97% studies was conducted by John Cook, a blogger and self-proclaimed cartoonist. So you're going to complain about cherry-picking, but you're also going to look at the most suspicious study? Isn't that cherry-picking? Cook lumped together those who believe that humans are the main cause and those who believe that human action likely has some effect on the climate. If you look at the raw data, this is what you get. The 64 who think the main cause is human is 1.6%, not 97% as was propagated. Also, several scientists whose papers were included in the initial sample had protested that they had been misrepresented, including Dr. Richard Toll who said, I think your data is a load of crap. But here's the thing. There are other studies which support the 97% consensus. And it has also been found that the more expertise that someone has in climate change, the more likely they are to believe that global warming is being caused by humans. And here's a good question that you could possibly ask yourself. Why is that? Could it possibly be that as someone learns more about climate science, they realize, oh yeah, global warming is caused by humans. I know that doesn't make for a good conspiratorial narrative, but I don't give a shit about fantasy land. But the purpose of these reports isn't to present facts. The purpose is to taint the public's perception of climate skeptics by intentionally inflating data to create a false argument of authority. And it works because appeal to consensus still remains the most common argument when debating this subject, even though it's not an argument at all. Um, not an argument. It's an excuse not to debate someone who is questioning the validity of your claims. Generally, I find it to be a case of, I know jack shit about the subject, you know jack shit about the subject, let's trust people that know a whole lot more about the subject. Generally, if you don't know anything about a subject, then it's a good idea not to debate someone on that subject. 
The reason being is because you'll probably lose that debate, and the other person would walk away thinking that there's some kind of authority on the subject. Here's a great example. Is it correct that the satellite data over the last 18 years demonstrate no significant warming? No. How is it incorrect? Based upon our experts, it's been refuted long ago, and there is no longer, it's not up for a scientific debate. Because the computer models say there should be dramatic warming, and yet the actual satellites taking the measurement don't show any significant warming. But Senator, 97% of the scientists concur and agree that there is global warming and anthropogenic impact with but, regards but to the global The problem with that statistic that gets cited a lot is it's based on one bogus study. And, and indeed, your response, I, I, I would point yeah. to your response, is quite striking. I asked about the science and the evidence, the actual data. We have satellites. They're measuring Correct. temperature. Th that should be relevant. And your answer was, pay no attention to your lying eyes and the numbers that the satellites show. Instead, listen to the scientists who are receiving massive grants who tell us do not debate the science. And you're asking me if we take the 3% over the 97%? No, no, I'm actually not asking about a survey among scientists. I'm asking about the objective data. You see, that politician probably didn't have the time to go ahead and read up on all the different arguments about climate change. Instead, he probably thought, I'm going to go with what the experts are saying. Also, if you don't agree with these mean girls, you can't sit with them. There is enormous pressure for climate scientists to conform to the so-called consensus. This pressure comes not only from politicians, but from federal funding agencies, universities and professional societies, and scientists themselves who are green activists. Reinforcing this consensus are strong monetary, reputational and authority interests. Policy advocacy, when combined with understating the uncertainties, risks destroying science's reputation for honesty and objectivity without which scientists become regarded as merely another lobbyist group. Ah, yes, you are going to use Judith Curry. Good work. Let's see. Um, she is talking about how there is a pressure to conform to consensus. Firstly, citation needed. When you are doing good science, you get funding to do good science, regardless of the outcome. The decision on whether or not to publish your work is based on whether the science is solid and if everything checks out. If you are trying to publish something that goes against all the other data that is out there, your case does need to be pretty strong. You know, the extraordinary claims requiring extraordinary evidence and all that. In contrast, when you are funded by Coke Industries, you are asked to perform research with a specific outcome in mind. Of course, there is the peer review process to weed out those issues, but uh, who needs peer review, eh? Why not publish and get your well-funded cronies to get the information out there? This way you can avoid scrutiny completely. But surely that's unethical, and, and you wouldn't do such a thing, would you, Judith? Oh, wait. Judith. Why did you think that you shouldn't have to subject your paper to peer review? Surely there are plenty of journals out there who are not under the thumb of the IPCC. There are a number of papers questioning climate change which have been published in peer-reviewed journals. In addition, you write this paper for the clients of your company and you are trying to use this to influence policy. So why would you not disclose who these clients are? Is it perhaps because you are talking on behalf of a lobbyist group and you may sound like a bit of a hypocrite? Now, I am speculating with regards to your motivation, but it does fit the profile. Geophysical scientist gets funded by companies such as Coke Industries, performs bad science and fails to publish. Subsequently, blames a big conspiracy and sets up a privately owned company which publishes climate change denial bullshit for undisclosed clients whilst rolling in the cash. It is funny how we keep seeing this story unfold. But no, it is the IPCC that is opaque and it is all the climate scientists who are in the pockets of the climate industry. Whatever the fuck that is. Scientists should be able to be skeptical without punishment. History is full of cases where the majority of the scientific community has been wrong or confused. Oh yeah, bring it on. Give us a list of things that we got wrong. Here are many examples. 
If it weren't for skeptics, we would still be measuring the bumps on our skull to predict mental traits, or we would still be burning witches for bad weather. Um, you are forgetting another very important part in addition to skepticism, the scientific method and advances in instrumentation. Also, are you really listing chemistry as something we no longer accept? Okay, that was a mistake, but still, let's not ignore that most of the things you list were never actually theories, but really flimsy hypotheses. You are really screwing this up because the ideas that you list were thrown out because of our understanding of the universe improving. But here's the kicker. Our understanding of the universe improved and our ability to test things also improved. And something very important resulted from that, and that is that we discovered that anthropogenic climate change is a bit of an issue. Consensus, especially politically driven consensus, has nothing to do with scientific validity, and using it as an argument has been historically dangerous. Are you really trying to say that consensus drives scientific results? Is there maybe? Maybe the, the slightest possibility that uh, maybe scientific results drive the consensus on this one? Scientific statements can be tested and proven wrong or right, and until a statement can be proven, it is merely a theory or opinion. Ah, okay, so you don't even understand what the word theory means. This explains a lot. Science is not settled by groupthink. It thrives on debate. It lives by argument and counter-argument. No, absolutely not. Science is not subject to debate. It is subject to data and evidence. And your opinion is absolutely irrelevant in science. But this is the problem with climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers, or flat earthers. They think that the facts are subject to debate, that somehow the facts can change the more we talk about it. There is a legitimate debate to be had when it comes to climate change, and this is the debate around what we do about it, what can we do about it, where should we direct investment in infrastructure, and how can we minimize the impact, but not the facts. And should reward those that break the status quo, not punish them, like the professor who was fired for talking about how the polar bears are doing great. But I guess the mainstream Ministry of Truth wants you to be distracted by thinking about sad dead polar bears instead of why your tax dollars are going to China. Well, you are misrepresenting this a little bit, aren't you? Now, this is a reference to Susan Crockford, who made this claim. She was not fired. Her contract was simply not renewed. You may say that there's no difference, but it is important. The reason for discontinuing her honorary position was not made public. However, I have a sneaky feeling that it has something to do with her lack of a publication record in proper peer-reviewed journals on the topics that she is talking about. Or maybe the fact that she writes a blog in which she claims to be a polar bear expert despite having done no formal research on polar bears and having zero publications in peer-reviewed journals on the topic. It could be related to her blog being flagged in a study investigating how misinformation on the topic of climate change is spread. In this, they found that at the time, 80% of climate change denial blogs cite her in contrast with 0% of reputable peer-reviewed articles or science outreach blogs. The authors of the paper had the audacity to do something as heinous as just pointing this out. Susan Crockford responded to this by writing a letter to the journal to demand that the paper was retracted on the grounds of it being defamatory. She claims that it is defamation to just point out that she hasn't actually published anything on polar bears in peer-reviewed journals, and she criticizes researchers without supporting evidence, and she was also pretty pissed off about the authors not mentioning that she is a zoologist with a PhD. Well, I am sorry, Dr. Crockford, I am pretty sure that you know that we don't really bother with the titles in the literature, as it just gets too tedious. And I am also pretty fucking sure that you know that public Publications in academic journals are protected from allegations of defamation, especially considering that the statements were true. One of the things that Dr. Crockford took umbrage with is that the authors pointed out that she hasn't published anything on the current state of the polar bear population in peer-reviewed journals. Going through the publication history that she lists on the website, it looks like she may have a point. I mean, she does list this as one of her publications, and this is definitely a peer-reviewed journal. 
I didn't actually read the entry properly and I just clicked the link to access the article. And then I noticed something interesting. She is not listed as an author. Turns out that she listed this as one of her publication, but the entry doesn't actually refer to the paper, but to something she posted as a comment on the paper. So leave a comment below this video and you will be able to take credit for the production of this video as well, according to her logic. Now I have to be fair, she has published several peer reviewed papers on the evolution of animals like sea otters and fish, but mainly dogs, and this was about their evolution during the early and mid Holocene. Now, keen observers may notice that the early to mid Holocene is um, not today, and also that dogs, sea otters, and fish all have something very important in common the fact that they are not polar bears. The point in all this is that there is no evidence that her contract was not renewed for making the claim around polar bears. It could very well be true, however, I doubt that it is. My thinking is as follows. She was appointed adjunct professor in 2004, and she has been publishing her nonsense on her blog since 2012. In 2012, it also became apparent that she is on the take from the Heartland Institute, a well-known climate change denial think tank. If your narrative is correct that she was firing for saying that polar bears are fine and that the establishment are trying to stamp out dissenting voices, then why was her contract not cancelled during the three-year review in 2013 or 2016? I'm guessing that this is something that is not brought up in the articles that you use as a source or directly plagiarize, because this kind of contradicts your narrative. Now, my money is on the discontinuation of her contract having something to do with her general conduct when put under the slightest bit of scrutiny and characterizing a pretty standard critique as, and I quote, academic rape. Even though she waxes lyrical about open discussion, she seems to be a big fan of shutting it down. But what about the 11,000 scientists who signed off on that emergency climate agreement? The list of names even included Mickey Mouse and Dumbledore. So you know it must be pretty serious when fictional characters start weighing in. And I'd really love to get the opinion of the customer service rep from Domino's. Okay, there are a few things to unpack here. Firstly, do you really think that they tried to bolster the numbers using fictional names? Do you really think that perhaps maybe these people would be a bit smarter than entering such obvious fake names? There are two things that may have happened here. Mickey Mouse and Albus Dumbledore are common names used to test IT systems and they forgot to remove them. Alternatively, it is trolls like yourself who enter that kind of information in an attempt to invalidate the list. But finally, what does it actually matter? You just remove those entries and then you will be left with 10,998 signatories. Finally, I cannot ignore your comment about the Domino's customer service rep. You dismiss their opinion, and I'm assuming that you are referring to the likelihood that this person is not qualified to discuss the topic and therefore that their opinion doesn't matter. Well, guess what? By your own admission, you are not qualified to discuss this topic, so your opinion does not matter either. In this document, it also talks about lowering populations in first world countries. Perhaps the UN will consult with China for help since they have a great track record of killing millions of their own people. But that would involve actually addressing China, so that will work. Yeah, I'm going to ignore that comment where you try to imply that the plan is to commit mass murder. You are a fucking idiot. Hey, fuck you, AB. That's my line, you dickweed. All right, calm down. Jeez, don't get your Kryptonian panties in a twist. Natural population growth in first world countries is already low and declining. Rapid population growth is only really happening in third world countries. If scientists really cared about this, they would be promoting the end of massive third world immigration to first world countries as a way to lower the carbon footprint. Oh, for fuck's sakes, we're back at the multifaceted thing again. Once again, it is a multifaceted problem. As established earlier, poor people tend to have more children. There are a lot of poor people in third world countries. Therefore, people in third world countries are going to have more children. A poor growing population has a secondary effect, 
of meaning that there is less wealth for each poor person. This increases pressure to immigrate. This means that if you prevent third world immigration now, then further on down the line you could have a bigger problem with illegal immigration from third world countries. A good idea is to try and supply services to third world countries to help them transition into first world countries, as this would have a lot of positive impacts. If only there was some kind of thing that had the intention of trying to achieve it. Oh wait. So the climate alarmists need to ask themselves if so called saving the world is more important than political correctness. But it bears repeating that this is not really about saving the world. Even if I concede that there's a possibility that anthropogenic plant food could be causing rapid warming, I'm highly suspicious that a group of people are telling us that the only way to prevent a global catastrophe is to give them more money and power to perform climate magic that is mathematically impossible, all while they sit there in their coastal mansions which should be under the water already if Al Gore was right, including Al Gore who bought an $8 million beachfront property with the money he made from making fake climate predictions. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that every point that she just brought up there has been addressed by either myself, Team Skeptic, or AB Science. So at least she's aware that she's repeating herself. There are real environmental issues out there like deforestation and massive heaps of garbage filling up our oceans and turning cities into landfills. Everyone should be concerned about the upkeep and purity of their food and water supply that's currently being poisoned by endocrine disrupting pesticides. There are several realistic actions that we can take to clean up the real problems our world is facing. And this is where she starts talking a little bit of sense because there are other problems aside from climate change. But maybe some of the solutions to climate change can help with these other problems. Or maybe even vice versa. But if man-made climate change were a real threat, there would be only one real solution. And it's not driving a Prius or eating bugs, it's soil and green. We got to start eating babies. I'm just kidding, it's nuclear energy. Now, surprisingly enough, I do have to give her props because she has made a somewhat decent point. Nuclear power can help with climate change. Nuclear is the most carbon neutral energy source per kilowatt hour. And it's a far better investment for the environment than the trillions going into the Paris Agreement. And she's gone ahead and fucked it up. Nuclear power can be quite expensive and that's one of the reasons why people would prefer money go towards renewables rather than nuclear energy. And despite most people's presumption of it, Due to that propaganda campaign in the 70s by those with competing energy interests, it's actually incredibly clean and safe when people aren't purposely being stupid with it or building plants directly on fault lines. While it's not perfect, nothing is, it's a good interim solution to a problem that likely isn't even real. Now whilst I do agree that nuclear power isn't as dangerous as people make it out to be, it's not a perfect solution. There are other solutions which would also help like investing into renewables and planting trees. Climate change doesn't have a single solution. Sorry. But until little Greta and all the scientists start advocating for that, along with criticizing the Paris Agreement, limiting mass third world immigration, and trying to have a conversation with a giant panda in the room, I don't believe any of their bullshit. So yeah, I guess it's fair to say that I'm a bit skeptical of the mainstream climate narrative and their agenda. So let me get this straight, unless they start talking about the particular stuff that you want them to talk about, you're not going to listen to any of it, even if they happen to be right? Don't you think that's close minded? But anyway, that brings this video to a close and wow, when you add up all three videos, you pretty much get a feature length debunking. You know, we should do that more often. What do you say team? Yeah, fuck that planner. You can do that shit yourself. Okay, uh, what about you, AB? Yeah, I'm with team on this. Uh, good luck with that, though. Ah, well, okay. Um, anyway, leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you think. As always, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.